Matthew 28. We'll read verse 19 and 20 again. Of course, we saw this last night. We took some time to break it down and remind us and refresh us of the importance of the Great Commission. Jesus has gone to Calvary. He's paid the sin debt for every man. Aren't you thankful for that? He gave up the ghost. Man did not take his life. He gave his life willingly. He laid down his life for you and me. Three days later, he rose victorious. The church is assembled. He soon is going to ascend into heaven. And he gives this command, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world." I think we're going, to, we're going to refresh our memory here in just a moment. But I'm thankful that when we are given a task to do, God gives us the ability to do it. Not in our talent. Not in our ability. Not in our mental capability. But through His power. And we need to be reminded of that, that we have His power available to do the task that's bigger than us. Are you... You look at the city you live in, the area you're in, to reach this city with the gospel and get the gospel to every creature, that's bigger than you. That's bigger than you. You can prepare a message. You can prepare a Sunday school lesson. You can, but still bigger than you. Aren't you thankful the Lord is with us to fulfill this task? Tonight, I'm going to take two different subjects, and they tie together. So I'm going to, I'm going to put them together this evening, and I'll move pretty quickly f- through the first part. Because I want to make a, a point, and I want to make a challenge to you at the end, and I'm going to put some pressure on you at the end, because I believe there's areas of surrender in our lives as Christians, and as church members, and as those that Christ has commissioned. We need to be surrendered to. The Great Commission is not a casual business. It's a serious business. It's a business that takes commitment. You obviously were committed enough to be back tonight on a Tuesday night. I trust the Lord will help us. Let's, Let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we pray tonight that you would help us as we look into your word and we're reminded of your commission to us, the opportunity we have to serve you, the opportunity we have to make an eternal difference in the lives of those that are around us. Father, I pray that you'd use what is taught tonight. You'll use it not just to your honor and glory, but may it affect us. Uh, may, it, may it stir us. May it cause us to action. And Father, as we sit here tonight and, and we listen to something we're interested in and we, 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 we seek your will, may we be reminded that while we sit in here and listen, our neighbors are in need of the gospel. Our co-workers, many of them, if they slipped into eternity tonight, would slip into an eternal hell. And Father, may the weight of what we're listening to, the weight of what we're talking about tonight, may it weigh on us, cause us to fully commit and surrender to this commission, your cause. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last night, I mentioned and challenged you that if you would determine to fulfill the Great Commission one time in your life, that you will have accomplished something that the majority of Christians have never accomplished. And how we really need to change the target, if I could put it like that, in in our goals as Christians and goals as a church. It's never to achieve the notoriety of the world or the pat on the back by the the religious establishment, but the goal, the target, is to be faithful to do what Christ commissioned us to do. And tonight, as we get started, I want to mention this to you. What if I came in this evening and said, and asked you the question, Emmanuel Baptist Church, do you have a desire to reach your city? Do you have a desire to see your church grow? What if I could give you the plan or the strategy to double your church in five years? Would you listen? 
You say, why is that important? Because if you get twice as many people in church, that's twice as many people that are born again. Twice as many people serving. Twice as many people reaching other people. You say, well, I, I don't know if I would look at it that way. Well, you can do that if everybody would just decide to get one and fulfill the Great Commission one time. I challenged our church last year when I taught these lessons. So what? Let's double our church. Let's double our attendance. I'm for the bus ministry, not against it, but I didn't start a bunch of bus routes to do that. I said, everybody get somebody. Everybody help somebody get somebody. Do you realize there's nobody in here as I look around that can't be a part of the Great Commission? So what? We, I'm, I'm afraid to talk to anybody. Well, you can talk to God, can't you? You can ask God to work in the hearts of people. You can ask the Spirit of God to prepare those to be talked to. Let me very quickly get into the strategy of the Great Commission. We've talked about the threefold task of the Great Commission. We're to win them. We're to baptize them. That winning them is a conversion. They become a convert of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's more, I don't have to tell you this, but just to remind you, it's more than just changing your social media bio. Yeah, yeah. It is a real conversion that takes place by the quickening, yeah. by the power of God. Yeah. After that, there's that identification with the one who saves you through baptism, an identification with his local assembly, and then to Teach them to observe all things. Teach them what we believe, why we believe it, but also I believe a fulfillment of that is for them to win other people, to be a disciple. There's a very practical strategy to fulfilling the Great Commission. The first part of the Great Commission is to reach the world with the gospel by telling everyone how to get to heaven. The second part is to baptize those who have accepted Christ as Savior to get them into the membership of the church. I believe in having an emphasis on seeing people saved. But I believe in having an emphasis on getting people to church. I won't pe I'm just going to confess it to you. If I never get invited back, then, then so be it. I want to see people saved. But I'm going to be honest with you. I want to see people in the church. I want to see a full building. I, I, I want to get people to church. That is important to me. Why? So that you can, you can, you can brag about an attendance or you can, you can feel good about a building being full. No, that's fulfilling the Great Commission. Right. Right. Then after we get them into the church, we want the third part is to teach our new converts how to grow in Christ yeah. so they will go into the world and reach others for Christ. It is the church's responsibility to carry out. It's not the mission board's responsibility. It's not a co-op responsibility to say, Pastor Neil, are you against them? I, I, I'll tell you that later, but I'm just telling you tonight, I'm for the church. Let me very quickly jump into the, a little bit of outline of the strategy. The strategy of the Great Commission, number one, requires commitment. I would say if you went into every Bible-believing church, and you took a poll among the, the members, do you want to see people saved? I believe it would be overwhelming, overwhelming yes. Do you want to see more converts baptized? Overwhelmingly yes. Do you want to see people grow as a Christian and see what's one of the most uh, fulfilling things as a pastor to see somebody, you can see the growth in their life. You can see what God is doing in their life. Outside of seeing somebody trust Christ their Savior, there's nothing like that. And I would say, overwhelmingly, Christians would say, yes, that's what we want. So why does it not happen? Because there's not a commitment to it. Think about Mark 16, 15, taking the gospel to every creature. Every Creature. That requires commitment. Well, Pastor, I just don't have time to 
give to, to every creature. That's going to take a commitment. I'll use myself and our church as an example. The only way we can even come close to getting the gospel to every creature in Jacksonville, Florida, we have to be committed to it. Consumed by it. It requires commitment not only to win the lost. Please don't miss the emphasis tonight. It requires commitment not only to win the lost, but also to follow up on new converts. We must be committed to see people saved. We must have equal commitment to the new convert so that they can grow. We must be committed to follow up on our converts and get them to church so they can be baptized. You know, we also can follow up on somebody else's convert who might be in our Sunday school class or might be in our age group. That's part of the teamwork I talked about last night. I'll give an example. There's, 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 we have different teams, as I'm sure you do. And there's, there's some ladies that just they pair themselves up and they go out and they're, they're each other's partners every week. And not too long ago, they won a, won a man to Christ. And so he came to church. And so they, if I could put it like this, they pass him on to another man so that he could follow up on them. And now they are working to get him baptized. What's the teamwork? But it requires a commitment to stay alongside people while they grow. Now, what, what, a lot of what I'm teaching is Bible tonight, but it's heresy among a lot of Bible-believing Baptists. We must have soul winning times. We must be, better yet, we must be soul winners. But there ought to be a, a concentrated effort to follow up on those new converts befriend those new converts to be committed to them I want to be committed to seeing people say but I want to be committed to those baby Christians we don't birth a baby and just leave it on its own we stay alongside of it it takes commitment it's the same way we ought to treat those who are born, newly born again. Well, our, our churches would thrive once again. They would grow. They would make a greater difference. You're making a difference, but they would make a greater difference if we were committed. So it requires commitment. The strategy of the Great Commission also requires consistency. I've already mentioned that a Christian who fulfills the Great Commission one time will have done something the majority of Christians have never done. But we must be consistent. 25 years, that's consistency. It's a blessing to me. I've, I've pastored in my church 11 years now, but I look out, I've, I've grown up in that church. Look out and see people who've served for decades. It takes consistency. Can, can I get on a little bit of a rabbit trail? I can commit to go soul winning for one Monday night, and I'm off the hook after Monday night's over. Or I can commit every Monday night. I'll, I'll do my time. I'm not saying we approach it that way. I went out, I saw somebody saved. But what about the new convert? What commitment do we have to them? What consistency do we have in befriending them and following up on them? It requires consistency. Thirdly, let me also say the strategy of the Great Commission requires longevity. The word longevity refer refers to a lifespan, the long duration of a person's life. It also refers to a time, to time meaning a long continuance. 
Please don't miss this. We cannot do something for a long time without being faithful. You should have a goal as a member of the Emmanuel Baptist Church, and that's longevity. You don't have to. You don't have to be on top side the whole time, but be faithful. You, you, you don't have to do it well, but be faithful. There's sometimes in the Christian life you're not thriving, you're just surviving. But show up. Be faithful. I'll confess to you as a pastor that there are many, many times as, as I, I stand on the platform on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, and I, and I see people in a congregation who I know are burdened, who I know are troubled, and when I see them just come in and be in their place, it encourages my heart. It helps me just by the faithfulness, the longevity. We don't get something started and then give up on it see part of the great commission that we need to be reminded of and i want to remind us is is that is the teaching of new converts the helping of new converts maybe you're not able to go out and participate in the soul winning ministries or you would say that's not a real strength of yours perhaps again sharing your testimony is effective i talked a little bit last night about planting the seed watering it than reaping. Well, if you're just a person that plants the seed, that's part of the Great Commission. But we ought to be committed to the new convert, to the visitor, to the person that just got saved on Sunday morning. There ought to be somebody who comes alongside of them and is faithful in being committed to being by their side. To be their friend. Isn't it nice to have a friend? Isn't it nice to have somebody that you can, you just feel better when they're around? People ought to feel that when they come to church. There ought to be some, it's a proven fact. I don't know the, the exact way it's worded, but it, there's been surveys done, and, and I don't put stock in all the surveys, but I do this one just because I've grown up in church. The more people will come to church because of a friend, than the preacher they feel like they have a friend they'll put up with the pastor if they're there if they feel like they have a friend ha have we thought about somebody who's never grown up in this but under the preaching of the word of God they get saved they start coming to church how foreign everything sounds to them now they have the spirit of God to give them some discernment but still, they, the things that are said, it's like, what does that mean? They need somebody to help them, somebody to call on them. Somebody, where were you? Where are you? Hey, we're going to be at Bible study on Wednesday night. Why don't you come? After church on Sunday, we'll go get a bite to eat. Now, notice this. Let me say, fourthly, and I'll get to the crux of what I want to say tonight. The strategy of the Great Commission results in multiplication. Who's the founder of the church? Jesus is. Who's the cornerstone of the church? Who knows more about church growth than anybody? Jesus. He wants the church to grow. He said he'll build his church. We just have to do what he tells us to do, and he will do, do the work. So if I am going to fulfill the Great Commission, I, I'm looking for somebody to be saved. At the same time, I'm looking for one of my converts to get baptized. At the same time, I'm looking to get somebody plugged into the church and growing. Say, hey, come make a visit with me. We, ought to be, we have to be working all three parts of the Great Commission. Again, this is not going to get me invited to any conferences. But there are times when I tell my staff... This week, you're not going out soul winning. You fuck. Let's see, it sucked the air out of the room there. I'm like, don't knock on a door. The only time, and I've said this in my staff meeting, and so if I get crucified for this, it won't be the first time I've been crucified. It won't be the last. 
unless somebody comes up to you and says, what must I do to be saved? I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to slow down because we have a list of converts, a list of babes in Christ that are just floundering. And you spend all your time visiting them, calling them, texting them. Well, there's a world going to hell. Yes, there is. We have a responsibility to the convert to try and get them to grow in Christ, to come alongside of them so that the, the Spirit... You realize that when they get saved, you know who, whose attention they have? They have the devil's attention. And if he can't keep their soul, which once you're saved, you're always saved, he wants to do everything he can to keep them from growing so they may not influence somebody else to be saved. So we should be doing everything we can to come alongside of them so they can grow, so they can be a witness to somebody else. If you understand mathematics, you know that if you have an equation, multiplication comes before addition. But in the Great Commission, it's the other way around. First comes addition, then multiplication. The Bible tells us in Acts 2 that there were thousands added to the church in one day. That's a good day. The power of God is no multiplier. See, the church cannot be multiplied without God's power. I'm going to ask you a question. If a church can double once, why can't a church not double twice? Maybe it cannot be done in a day or in a year, but a church can double. Think about this. If 10 church members, if just 10 who are in this meeting this week decided that if it takes the rest of their life, they're going to get one convert. One convert that gets baptized, Father's Lord in baptism, gets plugged into the church, then you've added 10 members. I'm not sure if there's any math majors out there, but that's how that works. So we've increased 10 members. Now it may take a year, it may take two years, and you remember how some of you grew? You were up and down, up and down, up and down as God worked in your life. Aren't you thankful there was somebody who didn't give up on you? There was somebody who was patient with you? There was somebody praying for you? There was some, sometimes you came to church just because you knew if you didn't, somebody was going to call you. But then this is where the multiplication comes in. There comes a point where those 10 who are now part of the church, they go get one. Now, you that got with one of the first ones to make the 10, that doesn't mean you, I've done. I got one. You're going to get another one. And now we have more people in the church trying to get more people to Christ than growing in the church so that we can go win our neighbors and our co-workers. See, we have got to be reminded that it's the task of not just the pastor, but it's the task of the church. Jesus gave the commission to the church to do this. It's just that the pastor will, will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account one day, but so will every member of the church. See, the, the, strat the, the strategy of the Great Commission is not all about numbers. But if we were to follow the strategy that Christ set out, we couldn't build buildings fast enough. But we've lost our way... Generally speaking, if you'll permit me to say it tonight, as Christians, as churches, we've lost our way in what Christ commissioned us to do. We've got to refocus to the strategy that God set forth. Are you praying for somebody you know that's lost? 
Are you looking for an opportunity to witness to them? How about somebody you know that's saved that hasn't grown? You ought to be praying for them to take that next step. What can I do to help them? You have somebody who comes to church, a new convert, there ought to be a race to them to be their friend, to help them grow. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts. To me, one of the most powerful stories in the Bible is what I want to finish with tonight. And I'll, I, I won't be... It's raining, so I can take as long as I want. It sounds like it's raining hard, so... Acts chapter number 9. If you look with me at verse number 10... Acts chapter 9, verse number 10. Now I want to talk just for a few minutes on the follow-through of the Great Commission. We have the strategy. We have to follow through with what Christ has set. It's not enough to know it. It's not enough to quote it. It's not enough to know that Matthew 28, 1920 is the Great Commission. We've got to follow through. In verse number 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. <clears throat> and to him the Lord said in the vision, Ananias... And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Well, you've got to think about this. Ananias wants to serve God. He's a, he's a disciple. And there was a certain disciple. Now, he didn't label himself a disciple like we're so quick to do today. God said he was a disciple. This is a devout man, a devoted man. A separated man, a servant. God called on him because God knew he could trust him. Could you imagine Ananias when he hears the voice of the Lord? Behold, I am here, Lord. Now, I don't know what went through his mind, but perhaps he got to thinking, what is it that God wants me to do? Pentecost may still be on his mind. I wonder if God wants me to preach something like Pentecost. I wonder if he wants me to go into a distant land. What does he have for me to do? Verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man who, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. This is Saul the persecutor. Saul the church killer. Saul the Christian killer. Saul the man with the authority to take a Christian, throw him in jail, uh, murder them. And Ananias just said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've heard a lot about this guy. Yeah. He doesn't fit the mold of the typical churchgoer, if you will. Right. God comes to him, calls his name, and says, I want you to go to Saul of Tarsus because I've told him a man named Ananias is coming. And I can imagine Ananias saying, you told him my name? <laughs> He's expecting me? We find that Ananias comes to him. The Lord continues to speak to him in verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. After Saul's salvation, God chose a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias for this very important job. Often lost in the shadow of the great apostle Paul is a man named Ananias. God called him a disciple. He was a disciple who never preached a revival of which we are aware. We don't know if he held a great position in the church. But when God spoke to Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Bible does not say that he ever started a church, that he ever saw multitudes except Christ, or did miracles. 
He was just a certain disciple who lived in Damascus, a man who obeyed God. All he ever did that we know of was help a new convert. But this was not any convert. This new convert had been a wicked man. He had a, lived a vile life. He was a known enemy of the church, a blasphemer. Yet when he was converted, he still needed someone to guide him. Certainly the story of the Apostle Paul shows the power of salvation through Christ. Might I pause there and say, that's the same power that is still working today that can save the most wicked, vile individual. But Ananias went to Saul as God commanded him, and Saul received his sight. As soon as he... Let's look at verse number 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul... Well, I'm not going to even get to my old out- outline, but let's just go through the Scripture. Brother Saul. He's his brother now. Saul was not even Paul yet. Brother Saul. Church, have we gotten to the place, I trust and I believe it's not so here to the place, that when somebody gets saved, we think they got to get to a certain place before we consider them a brother? The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm getting ahead of myself. What we need in our churches today, I believe, are individuals who believe that God has sent me to come alongside the Saul so that they can become what God would have for them to be. In verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Notice, he was converted to the road to Damascus. We know that story. Ananias came alongside of him and made sure he got baptized. Identified with Christ. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened, and was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Notice verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Well, there was the question, Isn't this the one? Can you imagine the awkward whispers? As Ananias called the pastor and said, I'm bringing a convert to church. <laughs> well, praise the Lord, Ananias. What's his name? Saul. Where's he from? Tarsus. Can you imagine as he came in and the whispers. Let me flip that coin. Can you imagine how Saul felt? Imagine, I imagine he hung his head a little bit. Because he knew what he was. Even after he was the great apostle Paul, he remembered what he was. And he reminded everybody what they were before Christ. But in the presence of the very people, I wonder as he entered that church, were there any family members there who by the hand of Saul had been in prison or put to death? Certainly, their church would be affected by that. But certainly, you think of Saul. I, I, I don't fit here. I don't belong here. I know I've been saved. I've been born again. That the love of God has superseded my own wickedness. I know He has a plan for my life. But I wonder if that, that, that bold preacher that he would become at that moment when he was vulnerable and the shame, he knew he was forgiven. But how can I serve? How am I worthy to be a part 
of this, these called out believers. And yet there was Ananias with his hand on his shoulder. There was Ananias that took him everywhere that he went. And Ananias that was theirs as God began to work in his life. Friend, I wonder how many Saul's could have become Paul. Who it was that God intended for them to be if there had just been a disciple like Ananias who's not the pastor, who may not be have any prominence or title, but God can say, there's a certain man that's been born again that I need you to minister to. See, the follow-through of the Great Commission is a God-given responsibility. You cannot say, Christian, it's the pastor's job. His job, to use that word, is to study the Word of God, prayer, and the shepherd, the church. His job as a Christian is the same as every Christian's responsibility. You can't say it's the pastor's family. You can't say it's a deacon. You can't say it's every Christian's responsibility to follow through with the Great Commission. The, to follow through with the Great Commission is an act of compassion. I'm convinced that most Christians are compassionate when it comes to the lost soul of somebody. But may we have compassion on the new convert who does, doesn't, know, doesn't know what that next step is. It's an act of compassion. We should have compassion for those on their way to hell by giving them the gospel and telling them of a risen Savior. We need to have compassion for those who have just been saved. There's many who have been saved for some time, but they've never grown, and they've never had somebody care enough for them to invite them to church, to, to get that new convert back with them. And it may take you say, hey, why don't you sit with us, or, or why, why, don't, why don't we go to lunch after church on Sunday, and invite them to lunch after church on Sunday, make sure they got to be here on Sunday morning. The follow-through of the Great Commission is also a commitment to helping new, the new Christian reach his potential. Might I say, very practically, Ananias didn't know that Saul would be Paul. He did not know that this Bible we hold in our hand today, the New Testament, most of it would be penned by Saul. But Ananias was a disciple who when the Lord said, go, he went. We have the command of our Savior to win them, baptize them, disciple them. Friend, I feel like I know your pastor in this church well enough. I know we don't know each other real well, although some of you I learned a lot about today. But I think I know this church well enough that there is a passion for souls. I'm not going to say to you anything I haven't said to my own church. But can I ask the question, does your passion for that new convert to take that first step equal. Now I understand if we can only do one, it's got to be the conversion. But may we be as just as passionate about somebody growing in their Christian life as somebody who receives Christ as their Savior because friend, you don't know what they might become for the Lord. And I want to come alongside and, and help them grow and become everything they can be for the Lord. And I wonder how many preachers never grew as they could because there never was an Ananias. 
How many, how many homes never had what they could have had because there wasn't an Ananias who said they were a disciple and just as committed as Peter had to be as the pastor of a church or just as committed as the apostle John had to be in, in his role, Ananias had to be committed to come alongside. Might I end with the follow through the Great Commission is a great and noble cause. We need to surrender to be witnesses for the Lord. Sometime if we knew that new convert was going to be a success, I, I, I tell you, it's a, it's, a, it's a disheartening and frustrating thing to invest your life in somebody and have them fall away from the Lord. But oh, what a wonderful thing to see God work in the life of somebody. We need many to surrender to Preach the gospel and give the gospel and be a witness. But Christians also need to surrender to God's call to follow through with the rest of the Great Commission. There are many like the Ethiopian eunuch who wanted to be saved but just needed a man to guide them. God sent Philip. But there are many who are like Saul and needed someone to guide them. God sent Ananias. God may have us just be like Ananias. Disciple who's continuing to grow, serve the Lord, and invest in the church. Can I, can I end with this? Are you surrendered to the Great Commission? Are you surrendered to seeing people saved, being a witness? We, we put an emphasis, and it's a right emphasis, on the, the young man has a call to preach on his life. What a noble thing. What an honorable thing. We encourage them, don't run from the call of God. The only way you'll be happy is to answer that call, or otherwise you'll spend your whole life running from the call. And oh, perhaps there are those in here who you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've experienced that call. It's what God created you to do. And don't we rejoice when that young man yields to the call? Or the older man yields. God calls somebody to the mission field, calls a couple to the mission field. But can I tell you what this preacher thinks is keeping the world from being reached? Can I tell you what this preacher thinks has caused a demise in our own nation? It's not that there are Necessarily, a bunch of men who have ignored the call of God. Certainly they are. But it's the fact that God's church is not surrendered to the command of the Great Commission. Are you surrendered to the Great Commission? Are you surrendered to being a witness? Are you surrendered to being an Ananias. But Foster, I think what would be a wonderful thing is if we had young adults, teenagers, couples, ladies, men who may not have a call to go to a mission field, but would surrender their life to be an Ananias. They would surrender their life to the Great Commission. Pastor, God may never use me to preach a message, but as God will use me, I will surrender my life, which means you've got to stay close to the Lord. You've got to be in your place. 
You're just, you have to burden your dreams and your goals and your desires, just like somebody who has to leave everything to go to the mission field, to say, I'm going to inconvenience myself a little bit. I'm going to make sure that new convert knows they've got somebody that cares. We, we have that prayer list of not just people that we want to see saved, but new converts that we want to see grow in the Lord. And I'm going to do my part to be their friend, to help them grow, to teach them. You know what you might have to do? You might have to learn more of this book so that you can teach somebody else the Word of God. You may have to grow in your Christian life so that you can help somebody else grow. Tonight, I want to leave you with the strategy is already there. We don't need to reinvent anything. Christ set it forth. We have to win them. But part of that strategy is to baptize them. Identify them. Many in that day when they were baptized, they'd be ostracized from their family. They, their life was... How do you think Paul knew who the Christians were? He didn't go through social media bios, hashtag Christ follower. He didn't look for WWJD bracelets. He was looking for those who were being baptized in the river. And there were some that were baptized as a follower of Christ who lost their freedom pretty quickly, but they were still identifying with the one who saved them. And then as they could grow so that others might be saved. Friend, you're important to God. You're important because He sent His Son to die in your stead. His precious blood was shed so that we might have forgiveness. We might be reconciled to God. He loves you're important because He loves you. He's, you're important because the church has been commissioned. And I hope tonight some of you will grab a hold of this. Maybe you can say, I, I can't be a preacher. That's not what God's called me to be. I can't do what somebody else can do. But I can be Ananias. I can be a friend to a new Christian. I could be a friend to a new convert. The visitor comes in, I want the pastor to know, I got him. That's accountability on you as well. Friend, tonight, however the Lord has spoken to your heart last night, tonight, we're not going to vote our country back to righteousness. The answer is the church proclaiming the gospel. But I wonder how many babes in Christ, figuratively speaking, are like Saul. They're blind. They don't know what to do. Do you have the gospel here? I mean, you're here on a Tuesday night... You're actually, I mean, you must like this church. You're committed to this church. Has this church made a difference in your life, in your family, in your home? Do you think it can do the same thing for somebody out there? There's a lot of people out there, they don't know where to go. They're looking for the answer, but there's a church on every corner, and they all claim to have the truth, but we know they all don't have the truth. There needs to be somebody who'd say, you need to come to the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Well, I don't understand everything. I didn't understand it either. Just show up. Just be there. I'll help you. I'll be a friend to you. And when the devil comes along and attacks them, say, hey, no, we're gonna, well, I'm not letting you off the hook that easy. Well, there's something going on in the church. Won't you come with me? Won't you sit with me? And commit to, commit to pray for them. Could we not find a Saul? Let me end it this way. Are you a disciple? 
Are you one that the Lord can say, instead of saying Ananias, call your name and say, there's a new convert that's blind. But I've got something for them. You say, oh, Pastor Neil, there's only one, a one Paul. That's absolutely true. That young man that just got saved one day be somebody's husband. The young lady is somebody's mother. There's a Sunday school class they'll teach. There's an influence they'll have. They can reach their full potential for God, but it's going to take some disciples. They'll say, God, if that's what you want me, while everybody else, while everybody, all the other preachers are at the fellowship having a good time, here's Ananias over here with Saul. Saul, come with me. I just don't know if I should go in there. They knew, come with me. Sit with me. Be with my family. As the Lord began to do a work in his life. Well, I like, I like to think about things like this, and my mind's a little messed up sometimes. Let's fast forward to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Paul comes to the end of his life, and he knows it. He says, I'm now ready to be offered. You think when his life ended, and he entered into heaven, you think there was a reception there? You think there was rejoicing there? We don't know how Ananias' life ended. When he took his last breath on this side of eternity, and entered into the presence of God, I'll submit to you, there was a great reception. Paul writes that he wants to stand, that judgment seat, that crown of righteousness. And all that Paul endured, and we are recipients of the life of Paul. But I would submit to you tonight that at the judgment seat of Christ, there's a disciple by the name of Ananias who never preached Pentecost, who never preached a revival, who nobody knew who he was, and the Lord said in my plan, Ananias, I need a disciple who loves me enough that he will help Saul, the persecutor, the murderer, the church killer, and help and fulfill the Great Commission by helping him grow and become all that he can be. The Apostle Paul is going to have a lot of rewards to throw back at Jesus' feet. But oh, I don't think there'll be any more than Ananias. And friends, sometimes we minimize what God does with our life and our efforts in his church because we're not the one preaching the sermon we're not the one uh, doing, doing what we call a big work for God. But if you will just do what God instructs us to do in coming alongside that new Christian, being that witness, being that encourager, being that helper, the day will come when we can stand in the judgment seat of Christ. Well done. Because you obeyed my commission. We need preachers to surrender to the call that's not the call tonight it's who's going to surrender that great commission who's going to surrender to be in the Ananias who will come alongside that new Christian well I can judge them I, I know they won't stay I wish it weren't true, but sometimes I do that. I look and say, oh, they're not going to make it. And they're the ones that now they're, they're, they're serving in some capacity. I never dreamed. Because God has a plan for them. Somebody's got to look past their past. And invest in their future. Father, help us tonight as we consider these truths. May we surrender to your will.
I pray that this church who certainly has an interest in souls and interest in fulfilling your command and your commission, may we surrender anew tonight to your command. May once again we fall in love with souls and not fall out of love with them once they get saved. But may we continue to come alongside of them and surrender ourselves to fulfill the Great Commission. We ask this in Jesus' name. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.